All right, welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, so this week I'm excited because I sent you this story like a month in advance, which I never do. I always find stuff at the last minute. But I had come across this one in a Facebook group, and I'm going to forget which one. I think it was a binders group, which if you're in it, you'll know what it is. It's for like all kind of writers, and usually those that identify as female. And so this was a story that someone was trying to remember the title of and they were trying to describe it and one of the suggested stories that was incorrect was cat person and so if you've listened to our cat person episode then or read the story then you'll see why this feels so similar but this story that they, they were actually trying to recall is called the feminist by tony tula tamuti so he has written a few short stories i read one other by him today in preparation for this to kind of see like what his body of work might be and i think he does this thing really well where he talks all about men and their woes these days. It's really modern and it feels really real. Anyway, it's good stuff. And in his book, I think it's called Private Citizens or The Private Citizens, something like that. It was called The Millennial Novel. So Tony T, I hate you, but um, you beat me to it, Tony T. But I feel like he has a real good grasp on like these modern day problems. And so I will read a section from The Feminist. All he's doing is sharing some of these gripes at a picnic one afternoon when his Cupac agenda friend asks him why he doesn't just call that girl from high school he went on that date with. He replies that just because he wants to be in a relationship doesn't mean he has to settle for a sociopath. See, you're moving the goalposts, his Cupac friend replies. It's easy to feel sorry for yourself when you keep redefining rejection because you won't let go of it. You refuse pity but crave it so much that you won't admit how strongly you invite it. He says they're being facile, though he knows their point is rather nuanced and specific. He just hasn't considered it before, but he can't walk it back now. I'm facile, his friend says. Nah, I'm tired. That's what it is. I'm tired. They say from behind their sunglasses, waving their mimosa. I know you identify as a reject. I know that's like your brand. Like it's some unprecedented form of suffering that gives you secret wisdom. All this nonstop high frequency whining. That's what's facile. He presses his lips shut while his brain feels like a swirling case of lottery balls as his friend, pausing to hit a spliff, continues. I mean, what the fuck do you want? Some how you got a shit deal. Nobody knows why. Maybe it's like you never really grappled with this shit because you thought you were exempt, but you refuse to change and are shocked when nothing changes. It's not like you enjoy it, but you do enjoy pushing other people's faces in it. That's your main consolation. Weird how you're always right about rejection since nobody's ever had it worse. Nobody's as pure and as wronged as you. Yo, everyone, check out the woman respecter, last principled man right here. And that's why you need it because you get to convince yourself that you're being rejected for your virtue, not because you're a bummer. You've turned your loneliness into this like fetish necklace of martyrdom and all of us, they gesture around to other picnickers, have to sit here and rubber stamp your feminism. If we don't indulge your wallowing, we're being called callous and like complicit with some diabolical global conspiracy that's keeping you from getting laid. But if we do, then we're disingenuous because none of us will fuck you ourselves, right? Am I right, everyone? Hands up, who agrees? Three women's hands shoot up, followed more slowly by the rest. His Cupac friend gestures at them like, behold, I just like, I don't know what to say, man, except motherfucking sishnuts. I, for one, am bored of your scab collection. I'm sorry your dick is sad or whatever. Suck it up, you bitter little boy, and move on. Oh, fantastic. That's fucking great. The clearest example yet of how even his friends dismiss him with straw man arguments. Because he refuses easy consolation, they'd rather call himself sabotaging instead of thinking critically for one second about the bullshit social biases narrow-shouldered men suffer under, which originate in the same toxic masculinity they supposedly abhor. He doesn't have the luxury of having fun, fresh relationship drama like theirs, so they got bored of him, even though listening to his problems is far easier than living through them. (laughs) So I stumbled, but that was one of my favorite sections to read because I love a verbal lashing (laughs) and... Yeah, I mean, this is what I do in the shower every morning, right? I verbally lash people that I have met, never talked to, like, you know, exes, teachers, anyone that I can think of. I am verbally lashing them all the time in my brain, right? And I'm winning and it's awesome. And here is a is an example. Hold on, there's barking. One, one second again. All right, back to my excitement about this story and the verbal lashing. 
Yeah, so I read that section because I thought it was a really good kind of summation of a character that unless you read the whole piece, you're probably not going to like understand. I think I think it's a good, it's, it's the conclusion as a reader I came to by the time I was reading this section, but to hear him explain it, right? And this is told in like a very, 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 very close third, but to hear him explain it, he is the victim throughout. And, and there's many reasons for all of these things that have happened to him, but to hear his friend and <laughs> just give it to him, it's like, no, that's what we reading and I fully support it. So I don't know, I I liked reading something that felt really relevant that way. There's this whole trend now with like white men who, especially after Me Too, feel as if they've been screwed over a million different ways. And there's groups that feel this way that, you know, women should have sex with them, all of them. Like these are real Facebook groups. And so I I felt like this was like a fascinating look into an individual that real or imagined is grappling with this. And he was was sympathetic to a point. I think the author achieves that. By the end, obviously, we think he's about to commit some terrible act of violence and it's a cliffhanger, but it's inevitable by the time you get to it just because you don't know where else the story could possibly be. It it doesn't end in a happy marriage for this guy. He's too far gone. I was just so impressed by it and I could see immediately why it related to Cat Person. You know, here's another guy in the 2000s dealing with rejection when it comes to sex and how does he deal with it? And the answer is not well yeah and the woman in that story is at fault and women overall in this story you know have somehow screwed this guy i just thought it was so believable and i read it just at the edge of my seat just like wow this is what he thinks you know this it felt real that way it felt almost as if this could have been a first person essay someone you know like a manifesto somebody explaining why they arrived at this point through no fault of their own it just all of it rang so true did you enjoy it? Oh yeah, the same same kind of reaction where it was like jumping into a river and you're just swept along. It was so good in that way. And it's not it's not in the it's vivid, but it's not like kind of vivid scenes, you know. There there are scenes, there are that kind of thing, but it's this this uh almost this argument, you know, you're kind of swept by the logic of it. Yeah. Rather than the uh like plot of it. Yeah, I really like this. This was actually you sent this to me and uh I read it, I don't know if it was right away or the next day or something. And then I was like, yeah, okay, let's just do that one. And I sent an email back and then I sent it to Jenny and said, you should read this. I, I've never sent her a story for the, from this. <laughs> Yeah. When I read it again today in preparation for this, I I didn't think about this the first time I read it. But the second time today, I was thinking, I don't know what the solution is to this real problem. Because I I do think it is a problem. I don't know how many of our mass shooters these days, you know, went through rejection in high school. Probably a lot of them. I don't know if it's the reason. But my point being, I don't know how how concerned we need to be about these kind of like one-off maybe gripes that these guys have. But it did feel like I said, like it illustrated a bigger, wider present problem and I just kept thinking like I don't know at what point this guy could have had some kind of an intervention that would have gotten him on the right path like I said he's sympathetic at the beginning he's thoughtful he's smart he's really smart like you can't fault him for not being articulate or well read or you know sensitive to cultural norms or any of these things he's like in tune and he wants to learn but yeah at some point and it's really hard to know when or where or how I don't even think he could articulate it at some point it becomes that it's everyone else's fault but his and that's what ends up like really festering and like I said I don't think the solution even for a guy like this would be to find someone I feel like there is something like inherently off yeah my first impression is it has something to do with empathy yeah that's a good point as far as a story goes like it being a story you know it's hard for me to to think about this you know because we do live now when these issues are so important not that they weren't important before but you know they're so yeah so much in the forefront it's hard to read this and not think okay, what is like, this is the presentation of a problem. How do we fix it? Right. But actually, no, it's just a story, (laughs) you know? I don't actually have to meet this person and talk him out of what he's about to do. Right. My ultimate conclusion with that line of thinking is that it's not, you know, let's figure out the solution in the podcast, but just that that felt like the hallmark of a really good piece of writing where I'm thinking about real world implications. I feel like a lot of what we read and what we later talk about as being great fiction is something that illuminated a real world problem and maybe it like fed it to us disguised as like some beautiful metaphor or something, right? Or like 
like you read a piece of poetry and you're like, wow, like the flowers smell a lot better today, you know, and you don't make the connection that maybe that was the author's intent. And in a story like this, it feels like very intentional that Tony T is trying to tell us like there's a problem with white men these days getting on these Facebook groups or, you know, 4chan boards talking about their narrow shoulders, getting together in groups and then it's just going downhill and maybe it's a more like overt delivery on his part, on the author's part to kind of like show this, but it still worked as a really great piece of fiction because of how quickly we read it, because of how well done it was with this close third. Like you said, it's plot, but it's more like him explaining how he got to where he is. Well, I think this story is, my reaction to it is that I feel like I need to figure out what the solution is. And I think that's its strength. It is fiction. It is just a story, but it's real. It's very, very real. I'm not going to meet this guy walking down the street. I don't have to talk him out of shooting up a whatever, but those people are out there. And the author has definitely identified something very important and interesting here. Right. So it, it is, that's, this is why, you know, that's why I sent it to Jenny. This is why I was at the edge of my seat. It was, it felt relevant. It's, it was, um, besides the writing, it, you know, the writing itself made it carry me forward and through it. I didn't, I have to push myself through it. It's not like, like the authors he mentions in here, some of them are difficult to read, but this is not. <laughs> right. I can see why people too would have confused it for Cat Person because it does feel like the kind of relevant New Yorker piece, right? It feels like something that you would have read in a magazine that like seems to pride itself on capturing current sentiments. Like we talked about the other one that this kind of reminded me of. I've only referred to it a thousand times and still can't remember it, but she fucks the Republican. Oh, gender studies. Yes. So we've talked about that story too in terms of how quickly it must have been written because it was written before Trump had been elected, but when it was like, I think he might have been the nominee. Like he wasn't just a funny debate stage quote at that point. He was a real threat. (laughs) A threat! And how quickly they turned that around and got that out. And this feels, obviously this is going to be a, something we're dealing with longer term, but yeah, just it, it's relevant. It seems like the right publication would have scooped it. One thing about this story that I find, I don't think this is a problem with it, but it's something I, I feel like I should point out is it starts with the character in high school, right? And then it ends when he's 40 something, mid forties, maybe maybe approaching 50. And then he's, he walks in this place with a backpack full of something. He's going to do something terrible. Terrible. That's uh, well, that's like 30 plus years. Yeah. And those 30 plus years are spent in our current social moment. Yes. They're not, there's no evolution of the culture. There's no change in the way in which oh, these sure. issues are, are addressed or thought about. And I don't, like I said, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's, that's appropriate for what's being done here, but it's an interesting thing as far as a story being told where it doesn't progress, it doesn't have that kind of sense of history or historical thoughts and then the movement through time. He's kind of aging in a in an eternal moment that's now. Yeah. The closest I can like think that that might be similar to is something like if he like say he's about to bomb this restaurant and he survives when he goes and sits down and talks to the cops, their narrative is going to feel similar in that way. Right. His history will be described only in the context of his crime. So we see that all the time in like um, documentaries about well-known criminals. So like, I don't know, the Unabomber or Ted Bundy, like you're not hearing about Ted Bundy as a sweet boy that was a sweet boy in whatever time he grew up. I don't know, like the 50s. You're hearing about Ted Bundy. He was sweet, but we know he was a killer. (laughs) That's right. So it's kind of creepy. You know, like you can't remove the knowledge that you have. I like that it's told that way. I like that we kind of get the sense, even though we don't know where it lands by the time we start reading it, it does feel kind of like it's been reduced for our benefit to just highlight the reasons why he is what he is now. We don't know what now ends up being, but but we're getting an explanation. It feels like a manifesto. It does. It's rambling. It's it's so selfish and first person centric. It's like the kind of story where if it was in first person, like you'd kind of read it and be like, why do you think I'm like, this is the kind of shit you wouldn't read unless the guy had killed a bunch of people. That's how all oh, manifestos yeah. read. You're reading yeah. them and you're like, God, this guy's a garbage writer. This is all over the place, but it all feels relevant and important to understand and to try to understand who this guy is by the end. So that's why you're like sucking it up. And that's what this felt like. It's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. We're getting all these like inner secrets of, you know, like I said, we don't know what happens at the end, but I'm reading it in the context of like knowing what has happened 
happened in real life and other very similar situations. I'm reading this like it's happened to these other real guys. Yeah. And I'm reading it thinking like this is a real good insight. Wow, I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Well, my, you know, if this began 30 years ago and is ending now, then, yeah. you know, the 90s were very different than yes. these, these issues. He did not go to that high school in the 90s. But if no. it began now and it's ending in 30 years, I just want my flying cars. That's all. <laughs> yeah. But the manifesto idea is kind of a good one because in writing something like that, if it's biographical, you're going to, like you said, for these documentaries about like murderers and stuff, it's going to be cast as the biography of a murderer, even when he wasn't a murderer, even when that person had not murdered anyone yet. And this is the same way. It's like, even if the culture hasn't gotten there, even if the culture has moved, has changed, the story is about the culture that shaped, that, that is shaping and creating this moment at the end. Yeah. Right, right. It, yeah, it's it's all about it's all in the context of what ultimately happens. Yeah. Like not necessarily every step that led up to it. Yeah. The other I don't know where this fits in our conversation except that I wrote it down and wanted to mention it, but almost the only like thing aside from the bit that I read that's like in scene really or like for an extended amount of time is is the bit where he goes on the date with the girl from high school. So like he mentions her in the first paragraph. He's like, you know, aside from this girl who liked me in high school and who I felt confident rejecting because she was curvy and I didn't like curvy girls and there's like nothing wrong with my preference you know so I told her that he hooks up with her again because he's desperate at this point in his life this seems like it's during college I think yeah and so he like hits her up and he meets with her and um, for some reason she agrees and by his account it seems to be like going okay she though throughout is really really difficult to read and even for him especially for him but I think in general right he talks about how she goes from really being really engaging to like looking like she's about to cry and then he, he asks if he can kiss her and she's like no but then after that they go back to his place and they have sex and it's not very good, but but he tries, which is like a big deal, right? Like that paragraph I think starts when he sa- it says like at 32, he had sex. This is obviously something he's been working toward. And it was like the ace in his pocket to call this high school chick. Anyway, by the end, uh, he, he cannot perform and he can't figure out why. And it doesn't matter why, except that by the end, he feels like he needs to somehow tell her it wasn't her fault. And so he says, I think you're beautiful. And she says, I think you have a beautiful mom. Yeah. And it's like hilarious, right? It's like the best diss. If that was a movie scene, like good stuff. But what what I realized reading it a second time, not the first time, second time when I'm reading it like a writer, I just kept thinking that what he seems to lack is this confidence of knowing who he is as a person. He doesn't ever talk about who he is. He only ever talks about how great he is to other people and how he fully understands women. But to your point, he, he completely lacks empathy. And so how is that? And it must be that he's like not a full human right like he doesn't he doesn't have like these other distinct likes it's his sole purpose in life to get laid like maybe cut this out but that was a criticism for a a story that we read in our workshop where this girl's main goal in life was to get laid and by the time she got laid the character completely crumbled and i don't know how that fits into this except that like if you're if you're a character or a real human and your one sole focus is one thing it doesn't matter what it is it's just this like one thing like you're not fully developed like who are you outside of that one goal like and we don't even hear about it you know like we don't hear about what his life is like what his hobbies are his hobbies seem to be trying to understand women and trying to get laid. Like he calls people at all hours of the night to his Cupac friend to be like, uh, so about this, like, what do you think about this? And so I thought that character in that scene was such a great foil to him because here she is. She's like, yeah, I'll have sex with you. Uh, you have a beautiful mind. I don't know. She, she seems so real and raw and the opposite of him. He seems so concerned about being well thought out and presenting the right way. And here she is really abrasive, but extremely authentic she doesn't care if he likes her and that's all he cares about yeah there's also the when he asks her uh he asks if he can kiss her she says uh no <laughs> he asks <laughs> he asks why not what do you mean why not he <laughs> says because i don't want to who the fuck asks why not fucking asshole uh, I think that encapsulates what you just said. You know, that's, that's, he doesn't get it. <laughs> he doesn't have that empathy. Right. He has to ask why not. He has to call his friends and say, this person doesn't like me. Why don't they like me? It's like, just pay attention. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, he thinks it's a formula and he's really lacking like these kind of human traits. Like um, one of my friends says there's a lid for every pot, (laughs) which I think the other day we decided there's a seat for every toilet because some people are just shitty. But this is the kind of guy where you know that there's someone out there for him, but he he's been taught all about feminism. You know, he's he really prides himself on his education and where he got it. And he hasn't learned how to be fully human, which I feel like is part of what related to when I read it again today i had read your most recent story by kevin canty in the new yorker god's work so sander is at a similar disadvantage in that piece because he's been told all of his life that sex is this thing that he can't have and shouldn't want and he doesn't know how to grapple with the fact that he does and now we've got this guy and this story who's been given all the tools about how women work but not how he should work as a real human instead of as someone that's constantly seeking out a woman it's almost the opposite of what women have been taught right Like we've been taught how to find value in having a relationship with a man. Like that's how we find value as a human. And he's over here like being taught that same thing. And then, you know, suffering is his like actual individuality. It's like, well, welcome to women's, (laughs) the women, like, you're not a sex object in women's minds. You need to be more than that. And he's baffled by this, right? He's looking for any hole to stick it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not trying to make a, a human, like a personal connection with him. He's not, he's like, I don't know. He's not, doesn't have real friends. These friends, quote unquote friends that he's uh, asking out and they're rejecting him. It's like probably there's something he's not noticing that he's not engaged in any kind of real friendship or real connection with them. Right. Yeah. I feel bad drawing that conclusion because like, I said I'm thinking about what the solution is for this and it's not to tell these men that they're broken but but there they are they are missing something so I mean there is something like to that though you yeah you're not going to be able to overcome it unless you face it right Right. he has to acknowledge that his cupac friend who told him all this stuff was right yeah he has that one moment he's like it's not that they're wrong i just hadn't considered it and i can't walk it back now and it's like if only he had like put all of his effort you know into that So back to your point about how much time this story covers, it does speed up, right? So we spend a little bit of time on high school. We spend the bulk of our time in college. The fact that he has sex at 32 and kind of circles back to his Cupac friends, like, you know, deal with that, process it. And then there seems to be like a lot of time that we kind of sweep over where he he decides it's not so bad being single. I'm set in my ways anyway, and I will proceed as such. I will try online dating, but you know, it's not going to go well, blah, blah. Then we kind of like gloss over all of this stuff until he's, like you said, maybe in his mid 40s or 40s early 40s and all of this stress manifests as this bizarre medical problem and then it gets worse and then it's almost by the time he's deciding to do something drastic that he's kind of resigned himself right like well and then at the end we gloss over how he finds these facebook groups or these groups these message boards and he finds other yeah forums other uh narrow-shouldered men which pushes him over the edge it seems like right he's decided like he can't find love and he's got medical conditions that are going to kill him and it's women's faults because stress is man manifest as disease and then he like pulls the trigger i find like stories like that people sometimes when we talk about short stories they they don't realize that you can cover 30 years to your point but you're going to emphasize parts you're going to focus on other things you're going to sweep over other things but you can still give us a sense to your point of like a large amount of time passing yeah absolutely this is a good example of how this, how that's done without being boring yeah i like this line near the end i think it's right before the last section like right when he starts replying to that forum posting yeah, yeah, yeah. it says years pass all alike what a way to move past several like many years yeah i see that he was in late 30s and now could be late 40s could be some other time but all we know is he's just been on this rut this whole time right uh, but there's a couple of moments like that throughout you know like uh where it says a few years pass or this happens for a while or he does this and like you pointed out at 32 he he slept with a girl i forget how that's it, but the line is something like like um at 32 he has sex Yes. Yeah. That's the introduction to that section. So it's just this, these little moments of more time passes, more time passes. Also, you mentioned earlier about there's not that many real scenes. Like this is written in quite like a summary kind of style where it's just like, it summarizes a lot of interactions. In fact, the narrator's quotes aren't, are like what he says aren't even in, not the narrators, but the characters. Uh, Yeah. Dialogue. Yeah. Dialogue isn't in quotes. It's almost as if, as if it's being summarized, even though some of it is direct quotes, but there are little moments here and there, like uh, in the first few paragraphs in the beginning, it's um, he gets into bed and sighs. 
right? That's kind of suggestive of a, a scene, but then it just goes right back into kind of summarizing things, right? Yeah. At lunch one day, and then it's kind of, it's scene-ish, but it goes into summary like really quickly. Yeah, I always wonder too, you know, because I love this style of storytelling. I feel like every once in a while I've done something like that where it's like you're explaining an overall condition for a character and it's not in scene and you're going to give a couple examples that way. But this is done over like a much longer period of time that I've attempted. And so I wonder if there's any kind of intentional plotting that goes into that, right? Like does the author decide that there will be some kind of a timeline and at 32, we will have sex. And at 35, one night is when he'll get this disease. But then like in his forties is when this real pivotal thing happens and he discovers these forums. I imagine so. Yeah. Even if you didn't do it that way, like maybe that'll be my takeaway. If you didn't plan it, then you found it. And then you rewrote it to, to yeah. augment it. But think about, um, like, I had a visual while we were talking about how much time had been covered of timelines that you see in history books, right? Yeah. And, like, minor incidents are marked by a line and a date and a description. But the big shit has a photo with it, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or, like, um, just a larger description or, like, a highlighted portion on the timeline or, like, it's zoomed in or out. Like, you can picture this story that way, right? Like, at 32, he has sex. And that is a larger scene on his life timeline and and there's even that yeah the picnic's a big deal i think about all stories kind of this way in terms not of the timeline graphic but of you can tell like in your brain kind of after the fact how many words or pages were dedicated to a certain scene they 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 weigh heavier and even as cupac friend says at one point like oh the first 16 years of your life don't count (laughs) when it comes to being a virgin so so we don't see those first 16 years right because they don't count we just kind of skip to the fact that high school was a formative thing for him that's how story launches so yeah yeah, so much time is covered but not we don't start at birth either yeah i guess the way that this is accomplishes that with that summary style and those little touchstone scenes is kind of dipping into scene dipping into what we usually think of fiction as as being the immediate moments yeah that's that's a you have to practice to be able to do that well you know go back and forth between those modes and this is done really well Oh, I know. Like, uh, so that that's my only other kind of like note that I had written down is like, this is a, a writing style and a, and a stream of consciousness style, but third person. Like, there's so many things about the way that this is written that are so expertly done, flawless almost, that you can focus on things like, how do we solve these forums? You know what I mean? Like, I'm so taken by the story itself and blind to the way that it was executed as a, as a reader enjoying this piece that I can focus on these other Thing. But Tony Chi is really good at this shit. So the other short story that I read, like I said, dealt with something similar. And um, maybe we can like link to the the story or something in in the notes. But it was a very different writing style. Was, there's elements that are recognizable as this author, but his command of language and storytelling is. I haven't read something like this in a long time. I, I feel like it's oh, it's just so well done. There, there's like an X factor to it that you can't hope to mimic. Yeah, a part of it. It also is just the command of terminology you know he there's nothing um awkward about it it's all no. it's all correct yes he's not like pussyfooting around anything he's not unsure of what he's writing he is to the point we made in the kevin canty piece like he is an authority right he's an expert yeah. on this matter he's delivering it as it is there's no question you know another thing that connects it to uh cat person in my mind is we in the on the podcast when we talked about cat person we talked about how there's a lot of telling in yeah. that and how important shifting motivations were for that story mm-hmm. his motivations don't shift as much but there's the same kind of thing as that telling like because it's in that summary style there's a lot of telling that is to me i thought was reminiscent of the way cat person was written yeah that's a good point i do remember kind of talking about that and that story is also told in a similar vein it doesn't cover as much time but it does cover maybe a month or something and um yeah a few months uh, or yeah they're like yeah there's a period where they meet and they don't do anything and then they kind of get back to it and then like texting back and forth yeah and and then like he falls up later later i wonder if that has a if the element of covering a large amount of time lends to the expert narration yeah i mean well that's a feature of you know one of the the drawbacks of show don't tell tell 
as a piece of advice is that we fall into the trap of believing we have to show everything, which yep. leads us to dramatizing every little scene, every little moment right. where in reality, fiction jumps. Like we talked about in the last one where um, Sander decided to go for a walk and then it immediately jumped to his mother asking, what are your intentions without any kind of, it wasn't the end of a scene. It wasn't, it was just immediately the next line, the next paragraph was, and what are your intentions, Sander? Um, yeah. And this is, that's the same thing you do and you just jump. You just move there. You go there. And that's what this style allows you to do is to just dip in when you need to, get out when you need to, explain what you need to, and move on. Yeah. I think I'm now I'm understanding better what you said in our last episode, which is that Kevin Canty didn't just have a firm grasp of his characters and his story, but also of the craft. So yes, like if you think of a short story that starts and ends in the present and covers a day or something, you can see why you would feel as if it was inexpertly written if you were bored because it tells you everything in real time instead of highlights. And so yes, when you cover more time and you're in a short story, you're four to make decisions and how well you make those decisions about what to focus on is going to like, wow, I'm learning something. <laughs> I remember we were in the novel group and I got an argument with somebody about the way I'd handled time in a, the beginning of a chapter is like, I wanted to elide a whole bunch of time and just like move on to the next thing. And then he was saying, you can't do that. You have to, you have to show us everything. You have to, it's all show. And it's like, no, that's what fiction does. <laughs> you move from right, thing to right, thing right. between every paragraph. <laughs> Oh, yeah, one day we'll revisit that Facebook Live that we did the first time because there's some good shit there, but it's um, maybe a better format would be for us to talk this way, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Instead of like presenting the rules to kind of like explore, I don't know, because I feel like I'm learning right now. Yeah, it's in the one annoying thing. I mean, the rules are there kind of because it's a guideline thing, right? But guidelines meet vicissitudes of the moment, and you, you have to be applied to specific things things you know right yeah and whatever your story needs is not in the guidelines your story needs what the story needs and the guidelines are just supposed to help you figure it out and that's <laughs> the problem <laughs> oh my god that's like getting ikea instructions but universal instructions yeah <laughs> all ikea furniture must be built like this here are your four steps now here's one bookshelf put it together according to those four shelves yeah exactly all the tools are here Okay, so I'm a Tony T fan. I'm trying to think of my takeaway. Do you have a takeaway, John? Um, I don't remember if I wrote one down. My takeaway is this is awesome. Yeah. Maybe this is my takeaway, and I've definitely said this before. I think I said it for the gender study story. But if you can capitalize on something that is timely and examine it at a level like this, which I don't think most of us can do. I don't think most of us can take a societal problem and examine it this way unless we've done a ton of research, right? Like, it's not something that you attempt with something like, oh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks, right? But something smaller but relevant and things that people are really, like, thinking about and grappling with them like 2020 is ripe with these options that's right so if you can capitalize on it and then kind of um do what this story does and deliver it as what it intends to be which is i want you to think about this critically and i'm going to deliver it in fiction because it's better to read that way but i'm not mincing words or trying to like you know disguise your medicine or something like this is the problem and this is you reading about it and thinking about it versus like i said a lot of fiction kind of using metaphors and being kind kind of heavy handed and like creative, you know, they want people to like absorb a message instead of get it directly. That's what feels really relevant about this piece. So if you can think of something that's happening right now, like, I don't know, I'm not going to list things because I'll get upset. But <laughs> you think of something that's happening right now that people are really thinking about, like, the only thing I can think about, like, jokingly is like QAnon, right? There are people on these forums, or think about any forum or any conspiracy theory or any kind of like, you know, place where people who we don't understand are congregating. Like, is there a way that you can get into that mindset and like really explore it in a way that like, you know, feels authentic? Well, I don't know. I think the problem with uh, writing about QAnon is that there's already a lot of stories about the Nazis and it's just you're rehashing <laughs> old stuff. So similar. <laughs> I've read that book. Yeah. So like I said, you can't hope to achieve it, but it is like definitely food for thought to think about like a, a very relevant current moment and just like deliver it plainly. I think one danger with this story is an uh, unsophisticated reader, or the wrong kind of person reading it might think that he's a hero. I don't know. Oh. The kind of thought scares me. Like they might look at it and be like, he's making some good points in here. Well, 
listen, I was right there along with him until he bombed the place, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's the power of fiction, right? Is you're you are in the narr- this the the narrator, the point of view, the protagonist's uh, head, and you believe what he you try to believe what he believes to understand him, and um, it takes reflection after having read this to to figure out where things went wrong. Right. I think the reader, in a lot of ways, in this story, is like the best friend, the Q-pop friend. Yeah. Who you know has had to be a sounding board and finally like after much reflection right they take these calls over and over and over until they're like i'm done with this shit i know what your problem is so it took them a while it's gonna take us a while too but yeah i don't know i like this story but i get what you're saying like i don't know i don't think the wrong people are reading fiction (laughs) well that's the other thing is like (laughs) the wrong person is not gonna read this story (laughs) no i think they're on the message boards and having a good time yeah but if they are reading um i look forward to your hate mail (laughs) <laughs> if, they, if they're listening to very meta podcasts on this uh no i won't sex with you either if you, if you don't have if you don't have empathy you're probably not writing fiction yeah oh wow oof, oof. that's like our tagline <laughs> <laughs> all right Good shit. well very good thanks guys i didn't have a takeaway but that's uh, fine with me well very good back to john with this <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought we were circling it when we talked about like um anyway go ahead we can we can cut it there because I I don't have one in mind well you need to say so on the podcast I need to say so I was gonna just say something about um I don't know the structure of the story or um I really don't think I have a takeaway I wrote down it's in summary style yeah I think maybe my takeaway can be just this is a great story to study for how to dip in and out of stuff how to right. like structure things cover a lot of time and a lot of ground and decide what to zero in on yeah i agree and would we talked about that already so yeah so just hit rewind for john's takeaway that's right very good thanks guys if you enjoyed this episode consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website napleswritersworkshop.com and for daily writing tips industry news and great short fiction join our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash naples writers workshop